Good morning. This is Pastor Roger Kresge of Mount Zion United Methodist Church at Peach Bottom, welcoming you to our Sunday online message for this, the first Sunday of Lent. The season began this past week on Ash Wednesday. Lent itself is a six-week time of self-examination and repentance, prayer, fasting, self-denial, and reading and meditating on God's Holy Word. All of these are appropriate for the season of Lent. Also a note that during our in-person worship next Sunday, March 5th, we'll share in Holy Communion at Mount Zion, since it is the first Sunday of the month. And you're most welcome, always welcome, to join us at Mount Zion for our weekly in-person worship in the church sanctuary. That's Sunday mornings at 1030. But if you can't join us for whatever reason, we're continuing this weekly online message each Sunday also at 1030. And as always, the online messages are available to watch any time after that. We have a special message for young people on our church Facebook and YouTube video channels. That happens Sunday at 12 noon. So get those uh, young people, your your children, grandchildren, uh, whatever, to uh, tune in and watch that video. It's just for young people. You could say children. Now let's open with prayer as we get ready for today's message. Lord, we are so tempted by everything we see the glitz and the glitter of the world, the get-rich-quick schemes that are all around us, right in front of us. We believe that if we just have enough money, enough friends, enough power, enough safety, we will be okay. Lord, show us how foolish we are to place our hope and trust in these things. Give us hearts for loving service in which we will find our strength, our courage, our security, our home. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll get to today's online message in just a moment. It's called Guilty as Charged, and it's based on this week's gospel reading from Matthew chapter 4, along with some Old Testament references from Genesis. In today's gospel lesson we're about to hear, Jesus faces 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. Check it out. Spirit led Jesus into the desert so that the devil could test him. After Jesus had gone without eating for 40 days and nights, he was very hungry. Then the devil came to him and said, If you are God's son, tell these stones to turn into bread. Jesus answered, The scriptures say, No one can live only on food. People need every word that God has spoken. Next, the devil took Jesus to the holy city and had him stand on the highest part of the temple. The devil said, If you are God's son, jump off. The scriptures say, God will give his angels orders about you. They will catch you in their arms and you won't hurt your feet on the stones. Jesus answered, The scriptures also say, don't try to test the Lord your God. Finally, the devil took Jesus up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms on earth and their power. The devil said to him, I will give all this to you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus answered, go away, Satan. The scriptures say, Worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. Then the devil left Jesus, and angels came to help him. And that is the word of God for the people of God this morning. Thanks be to God. I'll ask you to pray with me as we begin our message. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Amen. Now, in addition to the gospel lesson we just heard in today's message, I'm going to refer to parts of Genesis, chapters 2 and 3. So, kind of figured we might start out by reading those together this morning. 
The Lord God put the man in the Garden of Eden to take care of it and to look after it. But the Lord told him, You may eat fruit of any tree in the garden except the one that has the power to let you know the difference between right and wrong. If you any, eat any fruit from that tree, you will die before the day is over. Now the snake was sneakier than any of the other wild animals that the Lord God had made. One day it came to the woman and asked, Did God tell you not to eat fruit from, the, from any tree in the garden? And the woman answered, God said we could eat fruit from any tree in the garden except the one in the middle. He told us not to eat fruit from that tree or even to touch it. If we do, we will die. No, you won't, said Satan. The snake, God understands what will happen on the day you eat fruit from that tree. You will see what you have done and you will know the difference between right and wrong just as God does. Well, the woman stared at the fruit. It looked beautiful and tasty. She wanted the wisdom that it would give her, and she ate some of the fruit. Her husband was there with her, so she gave him some, and he ate it too. Right away they saw what they had done, and they realized that they were naked. Then they sewed fig leaves together to make something to cover themselves. Well, there you go. That's, uh, that's our reading from Genesis this morning. So that takes us on now to today's message. Guilty as charged, Your Honor. That uh, today's lectionary reading that we just heard from Genesis kind of leaves out maybe the worst part of the story of Adam and Eve and the, the serpent, the snake, as they ate the forbidden fruit of the tree in the middle of their garden. In Genesis 3, verse 12, that we didn't read, Adam blamed it all on Eve. Nice guy. It was the woman you put here with me, he whined. What a gutless jerk. And then in verse 13, Eve says, The serpent tricked me. Way to go. Both of them blamed it on someone else. And friends, I'm thinking God was pretty clear with Adam when he said, You may eat fruit from any tree in the garden except the one that has the power to let you know the difference between right and wrong. If you eat fruit from that tree, you will die before the day is over. Wow, you know, I'm kind of thinking that was a pretty clear uh, hands-off message there from God. What do you think? So the verdict today is guilty as charged. Now, God showed some mercy. Instead of killing them, God promptly kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden and posted a heavenly cherubim at the entrance, holding a flaming sword to keep them out. Oops. Oh, and by the way, God wasn't very nice to the serpent either, the snake. Let me make something perfectly clear here. The serpent didn't really fool anyone. Eve knew darn well that God had ordered them not to eat from that tree. But the serpent was a sneaky devil, and he used tricky words. Now, if he had just grabbed some fruit from the tree, put it in her hand, and said, Here, eat this! Do you think she would have disobeyed God? But that's not what he did, is it? Instead, the serpent put some doubt in Eve's mind. If you eat this, you'll be just like God, and you'll know the stuff that he does. That's what got her. The serpent got her thinking, doubting. And the Bible tells us that she wanted the wisdom that eating the fruit would give her. The Bible also says that Adam was right there with her. So he must have heard the same thing from the snake that Eve did, and he must have been just as tempted and the Bible does not say that Eve talked him into it. Guilty as charged. The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu famously wrote, The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Now the season of Lent that we're embarking on, it's a journey with Christ, and he's going somewhere. So today we start on that journey through Lent. But if we're on a journey then don't we have a destination, a goal? It's not randomly wandering through a wilderness. No, the cross is our destination. During Lent, we're in kind of a wrestling match with ourselves. We're not out to conquer some evil empire like Star Wars. We're not out to beat some bad guy. No, we are too often our own worst enemies. 
We tend to create our own problems, don't we? There was a comic strip character named Pogo who once said, We have met the enemy and he is us. <laughs> oh, friends, we use this six-week journey through Lent as time set aside for us to focus on the fact that we have all sinned, we're not worthy, we do this to confess our sin, to repent of our sin, so that we can be reconciled with God our Father and restored to Him by the power of His grace. So the question this morning is, how do we get hooked into sin? And I think there are three steps to remember, three parts to consider here. The first is knowing God's will. It starts with being aware of God's grace and his will for our lives. God hung out with Adam and put Adam in the Garden of Eden to tend it, to watch over it. And God also saw that Adam was alone and that that wasn't good, so he created Eve a partner to make Adam complete. They were designed to help and to support and to complete each other. And how many rules did God give Adam and Eve? Just one. One. He said, keep your hands off the tree at the center of the garden. Eat from every other tree in the garden, but don't eat from the tree that gives the power to know the difference between right and wrong. Yeah, Adam and Eve knew God's will for them. Eve's answer to the snake, the serpent, makes it absolutely clear that she did know the rules, and so did Adam. Point number two is temptation. The second step is the temptation to act against God's will. And that temptation almost always starts with lies. The serpent, the snake, started out by accusing God of lying. And then he added another lie of his own. Now, by now, he had Eve doubting God's word. And even though she and Adam had the run of the garden, they were allowed to eat the fruit from every other tree there was, she looked over that forbidden fruit, and it just looked tasty and delicious. So she and Adam gave in to the temptation, and they ate. Let's learn from this. Satan, the serpent... The snake knows how to make evil look really cool. He really, really, really is good at making us think evil is okay. Even though we darn well know it's not. The devil tempts us into sin. But there is some good news. Adam and Eve didn't have the advantage of having the Bible to show, what, uh, show them what Satan is up to, his strategy and methods. We do. And because we know what he's up to, we can resist the temptations that the devil throws at us. And when we do, the devil runs away. James chapter 4, verse 7, Resist the devil, and he will run from you. Now, my third point this morning is shame. You will be ashamed. You will be convinced. Often we use the word convicted. You and I will know it immediately. We'll know it right away when we fall into sin, right? Adam and Eve certainly did know it. They felt guilty before God. They hid from him. And they were ashamed in front of each other. That's when they covered their bodies with fig leaves. So the whole thing of falling into sin becomes a cycle. It starts when we know how good God is and what God wants for us. And that's when the serpent, the snake, Satan, shows up and tries to trick us into rejecting God's will. And when we do, and we all do, we're ashamed before God and each other. Not only that, but remaining in sin without repentance, that leads to spiritual death. But then comes today's gospel lesson. Jesus shows us how to break the cycle. Check it out. Three times, three different ways, Satan tried to tempt Jesus away from God's will. He said, Jesus, you must really be hungry out here in the desert after 40 days without food. Hey, you have the power. Go ahead and use it. Turn these stones into bread so you can eat. And then it was up to the highest part of the temple where the devil taunted Jesus. 
dared him to prove his power. Go ahead and jump. God's angels will catch you. They'll take care of you. And they won't even let you stub your toe on the stones down there. <laughs> and then finally, the devil took Jesus up to the highest mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. You can have all this, Jesus. All you have to do is worship me. And all three times, what did Jesus do? He refused to disobey God. And he turned Satan away. Get this. He turned Satan away each time with the power of the scripture, God's word. Now, let's be honest. None of us are Jesus. None of us is perfect. And there are times when we're going to just blow it. And I'm pretty sure there are times when temptation is going to get the better of us. Guilty as charged. I think David had the right of it in Psalm, uh, Psalm 32. He says, confess your sins. Repent. God forgives. He wants to forgive. He wipes the slate clean. In verse 5, David says, So I confessed my sins and, and told them all to you. I said, I'll tell the Lord each one of my sins. Then you forgave me, and you took away my guilt. Hey, this here was a guy who had some guilt to deal with, too. Remember, this was the king who got Bathsheba pregnant. She was the wife of Uriah, one of his soldiers. And then to cover up what he had done, David uh, arranged for Uriah to be killed in battle so he could marry Bathsheba. He really was guilty as charged. But then when David finally repented, God showed mercy and grace. God is always ready with his infinite forgiving grace. That's why God sent Jesus, to take our sins with him, put his, our sins on him, and so we can be washed clean by God's grace. During our in-person worship today in Mount Zion, we will uh, sing the words, There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There's a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Now, this hymn is a uh, uh, traditional African-American spiritual. It responds to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 30, 22, as the prophet felt abandoned by the Lord. And you probably know the word balm, which is basically a healing ointment. And Gilead, by the way, is an area in the Holy Lands to the east of the Jordan River. Jeremiah was referring to his home. There is a balm, a healing balm in, in my homeland. Jeremiah was referring to his home. But friends, our God never abandons us. There is healing in Jesus, and we can start over again. We have hope as we put our hands in the hand of Jesus. And taking that first step on the road to the cross. Friends, reconciliation is possible. Redemption is possible. Forgiveness is possible. Cleansing is possible. And that is our message of hope as we begin this journey through the season of Lent together. Amen and Amen. If you've been blessed by today's message, please like and share this video on Facebook. Or if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to follow our YouTube channel. But most of all, your continued financial support of tithes and offerings and special gifts is really important to Mount Zion's ongoing ministry, especially during this COVID pandemic. It's easy to give, too. Use your credit or debit card at the link here on the screen. It's safe and it's secure. You'll also find it on our Facebook page or our church website. Or you can always send a check by mail using our mailing address here on the screen. No cash, please. And remember, please to include Post Office Box 263, otherwise your donation may be delayed or not even arrive. Blessings and thank you. You know, not only do we talk about healing for ourselves and our spirits during Lent, but you, my friends, can also help heal the wounds of people far away across the world. And... Uh, I was reading this week, I think I read there are something like 5 million refugees throughout, scattered now throughout Europe from the, the war in Ukraine. Refugees, people who have lost their homes. And uh, UMCOR, our United Methodist Committee on Relief, is helping to uh, 
helping to serve the refugees in, in their time of need. Not only that, UMCOR is also on the scene in Turkey and Syria and Lebanon after that devastating earthquake where something like 50,000 people have died so far. And uh, uh, I don't think the death count is over. So you can send a gift to UMCOR to help the people of Ukraine, the people of Turkey and Lebanon and Syria through Mount Zion. And use one of those links that we just gave you on the screen a few moments ago. You can send a check to our mailing address. Remember to use Post Office Box 263. But mark, a, mark that check on the memo line for UMCOR Ukraine. Uh, or you can use our online giving tool. It's safe, secure. You can use your credit or debit card. But if you do that, I also ask you to do this. During, uh, when, when you're in there, when you're using the online giving tool, be sure to click on that option that you see highlighted by the red arrow here called Write a Note. And in there, type in Ukraine or Omcor, and uh, that way we'll know where your gift is headed. So thanks so much for doing that. We appreciate it, and God will, God's blessings on you for doing you, sending your gifts. That's about it for our message today, so we thank you for joining us. Uh, and... Uh, Remember, next Sunday at Mount Zion is Holy Communion Sunday, first Sunday of the month, so join us for that. And we'll see you next week online if, we, if you can't make it with, uh, with us in person, Sunday morning, 1030, or remember that you can watch these videos at any time. And that reminds me, we always ask you, like and share, please do this, like and share the Facebook video. That way all your online friends will be able to see it too. Thanks for doing that. We appreciate it. Let me leave you now with this blessing and benediction. Be with us, Lord, as we go from this place. Give us confidence in your loving presence and help us witness to that love as we encounter others. Amen. Thanks for being here and have a blessed week.